uh, next speaker is Nicolas Cledier, who will not be talking about chimpanzees. <laughs> yeah, sorry, so um, I had to change a bit the, the topic of my talk. Uh, but I'm still talking about um, monkeys and animal culture. And so the title is a comparative study of culture. I've been looking at um, the way in which biological evolution and cultural evolution um, interact or similar. And in recent years, I've been focusing mainly on animal culture and the way it uh, changes. So I'm going to assume uh, two things. Uh, first, that animal culture exists. So I think the last uh, sort of 10, 15 years of research have shown quite a broad range of uh, interesting uh, phenomena in that animal that are similar or comparable to um, basic uh, human culture. So what you see here is uh, six different groups of chimpanzees, and from each panel here, uh, you see different behaviors. And um, I liked it, uh, behaviors are behaviors that you find in one group and that you do not find in another group. And interestingly, all these behaviors um, cannot be easily explained by ecological differences or genetic differences. And so we think that these behaviors are transmi transmitted through uh, social learning, and therefore that they are, they are similar to some extent to uh, human culture. And so since the work of uh, Andy White and colleagues in 99, there has been a large number of studies in orangutans and whales and dolphins, and then further on with birds, rats, fish, and so on and so forth. So over the last 15 years, there's been a huge increase in uh, this kind of research. So I take it that this um, exists and show that there is uh, some kind of animal culture. And the other thing is we know that sometimes um, animal culture can also be stable. So we know, for instance, from uh, chimpanzees that um, nut cracking can be, um, has been used by chimpanzees for the last uh, couple of hundred years. And then we know from the study from Kawai and uh, Japanese macaques that they've been uh, washing these potatoes for at least 50 years, so across several generations. So where does uh, animal culture or where does culture come from? So for behavior to be cultural, we need two things. We need first um, for the behavior to just spread across individuals in a group. And then we need the behavior to remain stable during the process of transmission, as Dan was uh, pointing out. So when I, uh, when I started, uh, I think the, the standard explanation or the sort of widespread explanation for explaining was the spread and the stability of culture was something like this. So um, if animals can solve new problems by observing conspecifics, then new behaviors are going to spread through the population, giving rise to population-specific behaviors, and that explains uh, geographic viability. And therefore, imitation or the forms of social learning can explain both the spread and the stability of uh, culture in non-human animals. <coughs> and so I'm, I'm going to challenge um, this uh, classical explanation and trying to look at uh, how we can explain cultural stability in, in animals. So first, imitation and cultural stability. So the general idea that social learning um, can stabilize culture, I think, comes from what Dan was saying, comes from an analogy with biological evolution, where in biology you find very high fidelity transmission. And this is fundamental uh, in biology because it is a necessary condition for natural selection to just exist. Uh, so we know um, that uh, if mutation rate becomes too important, then a natural selection uh, just collapses and cannot, cannot do anything. And so the genetic material has a crucial role in high fidelity transmission because its stability is not simply linked to its uh, chemical properties, but it's mainly linked to its capacity to be replicated. That's something that Richard Dawkins, for instance, has insisted a lot on. But furthermore, what is really important, I think, is the fact that the fidelity of replication in biology is itself controlled by natural selection. So the mutation rate, we know that the mutation rate can evolve. We know that the mutation rate is uh, uh, under natural selection pressure. And therefore, that the fidelity is really the function of replication. And so what, what we are trying to find, if we want to draw the analogy between biological evolution and cultural evolution very deeply, 
I think we need to find an equivalent of replication or something like that in culture. And the prime candidate, I think, is um, imitation. So I'm going to uh, present to you just one study that I did recently, but that is similar to a lot of studies uh, in the field. So in this study, we, we were working with squirrel monkeys, and we looked at uh, classical to actions open diffusion chain study, which in fact simply means that we had uh, two different groups of monkeys, and we isolated one individual from each group, and we trained uh, the two individuals separately to use two different techniques to, to open a small uh, puzzle box, and from the puzzle box they could get uh, a small reward. And then we just want the models, we are trying, we just open the access to everyone, and then we recorded the use of the different techniques by the different uh, monkeys. So I did this in Living Links, that's a research center in Edinburgh, where we have uh, one group of monkeys that say is in this wing on the west, and we have one group of monkeys that's on the east, and we have both squirrel monkeys and capuchin monkeys. And these two groups can sort of see and interact with each other, but they can't cross, so they can't uh, move from one side to the other side. And we took the two alpha males from the squirrel monkeys, so one alpha male from the west. Uh, we took to open this sort of door that is held in position with small magnets. We took this alpha male to sort of uh, turn the door on the side, so they swing the door. And we took this alpha male to just uh, grab the knob in the center and just pull, so the lift technique. So we had two monkeys that were trying to use two different techniques. And then, what, uh, just to show you rapidly what is happening, so that's after the experiment, uh, when we could put the camera inside the search uh, place, that the different monkeys are coming and just uh, opening the box. So <coughs> in this condition, we get several individuals coming and trying to interact. Um, and you can see that they use slightly different technique even though we are, uh, we are in the same group. Okay, so that's the other technique. <coughs> and so what we did from this is um, build a network of relationship between all the monkeys that were taking part in the experiment. So here you have one group and you can draw the, the entire network for the whole group. And what we have is, so the size of the node represents the centrality index for network property, and then the pot chart represents the technique that you use, if it's blue it's a lift technique, if it's red it's sort of swing technique, and then you can look at the spread of the technique within the group, so that's the actual model, and then it's spread to uh, progressively to different individuals in the group. Okay, and what you can see here is that most individuals are going to use uh, two different techniques at least. <coughs> And so from this, what we can do is uh, look at the difference between the two groups, and what we find is a social learning effect. So we find that on the east side, we have a lift model, and individuals are more likely to do lift than on the west side, where we had a swing model, and individuals are more likely to do swing. So I would say that's, that's um, a classical result. But what this is masking is um, the effect of time. So if you look at the actual number of sections and the similarity with the model, what you see is that there is one group in which it's uh, quite stable, but the other group, the similarity drops down. And that means that the difference between the two groups is progressively collapsing through time. And in fact, if you, if you look at several studies, uh, we are doing the same kind of experiment with transmission of, of new uh, techniques, you can estimate the fidelity of social learning. And what you find here uh, for these studies is that the fidelity is quite high, it's say between 85 to 95 percent. That, that kind of fidelity is, I mean, it's high, it's interesting, uh, but it's not high enough to stabilize group differences for a very long time. So if you look at the mean difference between groups, and uh, you start, um, you're just looking at the prediction from these different levels of fidelity, so you start with maximally different groups, and uh, if you look at the number of sessions, then after about 10, 50 sessions, then the difference between groups is dropped to 50%. So the kind of fidelity that we find in social learning studies when we are trying to look at the way in which 
individuals learn from each other uh, cannot really explain the stability that we find in the wild, in the stability that is over several generations uh, for a very long time. So I think that's uh, the first conclusion I wanted to draw from this set of studies, is that transmission chain experiment show that social transmission, social learning, and in particular imitation, is not feasible enough to explain cultural stability. Uh, can we find exceptions? Well, of course, I mean, we are in biology. And so first of all, we find exceptions in humans. So we know that words um, with very high frequency can be transmitted very faithfully. They have very, very low rates of change, so that are quite comparable to biological mutation rates. Now I'm going to focus on um, um, bird songs. So for instance, in this study by Grant and colleagues, uh, Grant and Grant on uh, Darwin finches, uh, they looked at um, several generations of finches and they wanted to know what kind of uh, song they would produce. And you have the song of the father and the song of the sons. And what you see is that the songs are transmitted with quite high fidelity and again across several generations. And I think what we can learn from these exceptions is the reason why there are exceptions. So why is this high fidelity transmission when uh, we don't find this um, elsewhere? Well, so Grant and Grant argue that uh, males learn to sing the song of their father. Okay, so when they're born, they, try to, they, they learn to recognize and then song, uh, sing the song of their father. And then they also show that females learn to recognize their father's song and then choose a male with similar yet slightly different song. And the reason here is linked to the Galapagos Islands where there are lots of um, Darwin finches. <coughs> and uh, so a female is going to choose a male to mate with, and so she learns to recognize the song of her father. And if she tries to mate with a male who is singing a song that is very similar to her father, then she is going to probably mate with her brother. And that's not really good. At the same time, if she is choosing, choosing a male who is singing a very different song, then she might mate with a male who is uh, coming from an entirely different species. And that's not good either. So the reason why we find high fidelity transmission in this system is because um, it's naturally selected for. So the faithfulness of transmission is a result of uh, natural selection for high fidelity. So high fidelity transmission can exist if it is selected for. And similarly, again, in genetics, we find that replication is faithful because it is under the control of natural selection. But of course, in general, um, as Dan was saying, learning mechanisms are not selected for their fidelity, but to transform and, ad and adapt what has been learned to fit the, the purpose of the individual. So if you have a child who is trying to ride a bicycle, and she is looking at her father and to learn to do that, then she's not trying to exactly reproduce the actions uh, of her father. I mean, she's just trying to get some sense of what she has to do to run the bicycle properly, but she has different physical properties, she has different strengths, she has a different bicycle, and so on and so forth. So that's uh, for the fidelity of social learning. Now, uh, another proposition was to explain cultural stability depending on uh, the mode in which the information gets transmitted across individuals. And I think that's uh, very relevant to this uh, three-day uh, workshop. So <coughs> I'm sure everybody is quite familiar with this, but I'm just going to run through it uh, to just remind you. So modes of transmission are linked between the, the way in which information gets transmitted across generations. So if we have the first generation here and the second one here, then there's three uh, broad or classical modes of transmission. There's vertical, from parents to offspring. There's horizontal, across the same generation, or oblique, from the previous generation to the next one. And in biology, these modes of transmission are quite uh, important. So we can, in biology, what we would try to do is to construct um, a model of genetic evolution. So we get different individuals in generation one, different individuals in generation two. So we're looking at haploid individuals who have two alleles, A and B. A gives the color green, B gives the color blue. 
And to try to make a model of the evolution of these individuals, what we would do is uh, very simply something like this. So we would qualify the difference in fitness between gene, the gene E and the gene B. So that's what I'm going to call content effect, so the impact of gene on fitness. And then we need to uh, explain how genes get transmitted to, from generation one to generation two. And that is a mode of transmission. So we say that A gets transmitted with a certain mutation, right? It gets transmitted into B. So in biology, um, we have two very important properties that make this kind of description, I think, very interesting and powerful. The first property is that what is transmitted generally does not influence the way in which it is transmitted. So if you have a genetic mutation, it's not going to change the way in which the genes is being transmitted. And furthermore, there is a small number of simple and stable modes. So even if you look at uh, different uh, organisms, you will find, say, 10 or 15 different modes. Is it the same for culture? <coughs> Well, again, based on an analogy between uh, biological evolution, it has been suggested that this mode of transmission could play an important role in uh, cultural evolution. And so I'm just going to take one example. Uh, Ulet and Cavalli in 96. Uh, they studied 72 ACA. And they asked the following question. So do you know how to do X? And then if you say yes, then they, they would ask you, is there a person or a group of persons who show you how to do X? And then they studied like 50 different skills. And they also studied uh, Stanford students, I think. And so what they found is that there is a massive contribution from the parents and almost nothing from other individuals. And so they concluded, uh, one conclusion, however, seems inescapable on the basis of data. Vertical parent-child transmission is by far the most important mechanism accounting for about 80% of the cases studied. And this is, according to the model, a conservative mode of transmission. It assures slow evolution while allowing individual variation. So the idea here is that if you get the knowledge from your parents, then the evolution is going to be very slow, um, similar to genetic evolution when ver transmission is vertically slower than when transmission is horizontal or oblique. So I think, so when I found this, I tried to really get the implications uh, behind this idea that 80% of um, our knowledge could come from directly from our parents. So imagine we're, we're just trying to work out from the model how long it would take for a population to just change from one behavior to another behavior. Uh, so imagine we have two different techniques. There is a <coughs> bone arrow technique and there is a crossbow technique. And the bone arrow technique is less efficient than the crossbow. So individuals are going to move from the bone arrow to the crossbow technique. And so we say there is 80% vertical transmission. And therefore, there is 20% of the individuals who don't know what they do. So we are going to be very conservative. And we assume that they are all going to adopt the most efficient uh, crossbow technique. Now, just from this, uh, we can work out uh, the time it's going to take for the population to change. So imagine that we start with generation zero. There's only 5% of the individuals we know, we know how to use a crossbow technique. And we ask, how many generations do we need to reach 95%? And the answer is 14 generations. With 20 years per generation, that takes about 300 years. And that is the most conservative assumption you can get. So if we are really uh, getting this information from our parents, then to observe a change in the population would take about 300 years. So clearly, I mean, progress in the modern world is faster than that. But could it be different for hunter gatherer Or could it have been different in the past? Well, I don't think um, that is very likely. Uh, so for instance, if we look at uh, different records we find in 1911, um, Aka were not using the crossbow technique, but the Bantu farmers, uh, which are living nearby, were using the crossbow technique. And then 58, some of them were using the crossbow. In 65, most of them were using the crossbow. And in 96, nearly all of them were using the crossbow. So it's between 4 and 40 times faster than expected. And why, why is it faster? Well, 
because hunting techniques are vertically transmitted, except when it's very important for um, their evolution, so except when there's choice between different techniques. Because individuals adapt to new conditions and they change their system knowledge depending on the context and content. So when you measure at some time, point in time that it is verti vertically transmitted at 80%, then you can't predict what is going to happen when there's a new technique that just appearing. So in general, in culture, we find that there is no independence between what gets transmitted, the content uh, that is be being transmitted between individuals, and how it is transmitted, so the mode of transmission. Again, can we find exceptions to this, um, to this rule? Well, in biology first, we find that there are exceptions. So in biology, we find that some genes are going to affect their own transmission, uh, so-called modifier genes. So they're the genes that control the way in which genes uh, get transmitted. Now in culture, of course, we find that in some cases, we have um, cultural items that get transmitted according to very fixed rules. So for instance, surnames we know are going to evolve uh, through vertical transmission. So the difference, again, is more uh, quantitative rather than uh, qualitative. But more interestingly, I think, the reason why uh, the relationship between the mode of transmission and the speed of evolution is, uh, could be just the opposite between culture and genes. So in biology, we say if genes are transmitted vertically, then they are going to evolve slowly. If they are transmitted horizontally, they are going to evolve faster. Now, it could be just the opposite in culture. When culture is stable through time, then individuals have the same knowledge. So there is uh, homogeneity, special, especially. And therefore, in that case, when everybody is using uh, the crossbow technique, then it's just easier to learn directly from your father. So the transmission is vertical. So for instance, if we look at the famous example of the Japanese macaque that learned to wash potatoes. Uh, now, in the group of Japanese macaque at present, then all the individuals are washing their food in the water. I'm not sure you can see, but there is baby here, and she's going to learn from her mother that food needs to be cleaned up in the water. So juveniles uh, learn to wash uh, with their mother and the behavior is therefore transmitted vertically. And that is because the behavior is widespread and stable. Now if you look at the original study by Kawai um, that describes the spread of the behavior in the group of macaque, he found the following. There was a young female called Emo and she discovered the behavior. And then it spread, it spread from Emo to her mother and close friends, and then to her friends' mothers. So the transmission was something like um, horizontal and then backward vertical from juveniles back to uh, parents. So just to conclude on these uh, transmission modes, um, transmission modes in biology stabilize genes because uh, content and transmission are independent. Uh, individuals adapt to new conditions, and they change the source of knowledge depending on context and content. And therefore, in culture, transmission modes are more descriptions of what is happening at a certain time rather than causal mechanisms that affect the cultural uh, evolution. And they cannot explain cultural stability. Okay, so that's my uh, last slide. Take a message. Um, first, I wanted to um, insist on the fact that explaining the spread and the persistence of culture requires different explanations. And on the fact that cultural evolution, uh, in my view, does not match biological evolution very closely. But I think the comparison is very useful and we can learn a lot uh, from comparing the two processes. And finally, I think uh, I'm, uh, I'm concluding in a way that is similar to Dan, understanding psychological mechanisms is fundamental to explain cultural evolution and to know whether it is um, Darwinian or not, and how much uh, Darwinian it is. Thank you very much. Thank you.